My next guest is a professor at Mount Sinai University in uh, New York. Her name is Daniela Schiller. Daniela has discovered some very strange things about the nature of memory, how memories are formed and how they are recalled. And she's here to tell you that almost everything you think you know about the stable state of your memories is in fact completely wrong. Daniela. In 2004, uh, a new movie came out called Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. And in the movie, the main character, Joel, wanted to erase the memory of his ex-girlfriend. So he went to the doctor, and the doctor uh, put some electrodes on his brain. What he had to do is to retrieve the specific memory of his girlfriend. At that point, the doctor zapped his brain, and the memory was supposed to be gone. Is this possible? Can we change or even erase memories? In this presentation, I'll tell you uh, about research that scientists do to answer this question. Basically, we create memories in the lab, and then we try to get rid of them. So to understand how we uh, might try to change memories, first we need to understand what is memory. Memory is uh, an event in our lives that left a permanent trace in our brain. What is a permanent trace in our brain? Well, the brain is comprised of, uh, as Ed Boyden just showed it, uh, single units that are, are called neurons. Neurons are like cells, uh, like any cell in our body, just that they have these antennas that are they used to communicate with each other. So these are two very hairy neurons talk to each other. And of course, each neuron talks to many, many millions of other neurons in a very tight network. What's interesting about this network is that the neurons actually, they never touch, if you can see this enlarged image of uh, the side of uh, communication, there's a little gap. The gap is called the synapse. And the synapse is where everything is happening. This is where the changes occur when a memory is being formed. So let's imagine how it is to be inside the synapse. It would be, well, like being in Grand Central Station uh, in New York. So instead of people, just imagine molecules going back and forth between the platform and making transitions between the trains or between the neurons. So when a memory is formed, the way it would look is like Grand Central Station under construction. Um, and this will be a permanent change in the structure of the, of the station. And afterward, when the memory is formed, the station looks different. The synapse looks different. And this is the memory trace. How would we create a memory in the laboratory? Um, we will capture the process of, of how memory is working. So we learn something, then the memory is being stored in the brain, and then theoretically we believe that we retrieve the same memory again and again. And this process is called memory consolidation. Memories are being consolidated, and then we have a long-term memory, and we can retrieve it. In the lab, uh, if you can put the movie, please. Let's do an experiment. Uh, imagine you are... Um, a participant in the experiment. So you're sitting in your chairs, uh, and now imagine that there's a little electrode that can deliver an electric shock. So what you'll have to do is to watch the screen, just as the participant here, and try to figure out uh, what is the relationship between what's happening on the screen and when you get shocked. OK, so let's play the movie. The yellow, yellow square on the screen. There you go. I saw this movie so many, many times, I kill, still can't take the suspense. Um, so what you saw is basically the process that probably most of you know as Pavlovian conditioning or classical conditioning. You take a, a neutral stimulus, such as a blue square, and then you pair it with an electric shock. And afterward, you get really afraid of the blue square. And we know this because we measure how much you sweat or your uh, heart rate. So now you all have 
a memory, a fear memory in your brain. And I know that because if you come to the lab and I'll, you'll sit in front of the computer and I'll hook you up and I'll show you various squares, you're going to be afraid of the blue square. <laughs> so uh, are, we, are we forever stuck with this memory? Did I just create a subpopulation of people who are afraid of blue squares? This is exactly what we want to change. So it turns out it's actually possible. This decade is the time of a revolution in the way we perceive uh, memory. There's a paradigm shift. Because for an entire century, we thought that this is a fixed process. Once the memory is formed, it is fixed, and then we retrieve it again and again, and that's it. We retrieve the original memory. Well, what we know now, especially in the last decade, is that this theory was only partly accurate. It is true that memories are processed through this first time of consolidation, but actually, this consolidation process happens again and again each time you retrieve the memory. You retrieve it, and then it has to be stored again in the brain through another very similar consolidation process, which we call memory reconsolidation. So if you think about it, it's actually a window of opportunity. As long as the memory is not being fully consolidated, it is vulnerable. So for instance, when you have a car accident, um, usually we don't remember what happened slightly before or during or slightly after, and this is because the events didn't have a chance to consolidate, so the memory was never formed. So imagine that this actually happens each time you retrieve a memory. If you block the process and you don't allow the memory to consolidate, it might be gone. It's like taking something out of a box and not allowing it to go back. And this is exactly what we can do in the laboratory. We can trigger the blue square, the fear memory, and then inject a drug, and the memory is gone. So you still remember the event, but the fear is no longer there. And um, what this means is that the movie was actually based on true science. Um, so where things stand now is that this was demonstrated in many animals, many species, uh, in, in various techniques, but on very simple memories, on these associations. In humans, we're currently trying to develop these drugs. It's, m it's more complicated because, obviously, we can't inject directly to the brain. Well, maybe Aid Boyden could do that. Um, but the memories are much more complex. There's no specific spot. So this is work in progress. But what we wanted is actually to take it one step further. Because let's think about it. Why would nature create such a window of opportunity to um, make their memories vulnerable. We need to remember the fear, right? We need to remember what to predict. Why would it go away? What do you think? Well, possible answer is to update. So each time you retrieve a memory, uh, it can incorporate new information that, the, that is available at the time of retrieval. So you will make it more relevant to, the, uh, to your current state. Uh, how would we test it in the laboratory? Well, we'll trigger the blue square again, but now instead of giving a drug, we'll provide new information. Uh, what we'll do is provide safety information. We'll tell you now that the blue square is safe, and the way we do it in the laboratory is make very uh, quick repeated presentations of the, the blue square without the shock that tells you that the, the blue square is safe. And if we do it at the time the memory is active in your brain, it actually changes the meaning. So you remember the blue square, but now you remember that it's safe and that it's not fearful. And this depends on your memory being active and then incorporating this new information. What it tells us is that we don't really remember the original event. What we remember is the last version of it. And each time we retrieve, we revise our memories. So for instance, our original memories of Grand Central Station, at one point we can remember it in really bright colors. Another point in our lives, it can be very dramatic and dark. We might remember the station as a clean and calming or the, the most busy place we saw, but probably most of us will just remember it as like one big Apple store. <laughs> so paradoxically, what it tells us is that in order to change our memories, we have to relive them. And we actually need to relive the bad memories if we want to change them and to change their meanings. Uh, what it tells us is that uh, we're actually free. We're not slaves to our uh, past. Uh, we can change our memories. If there was a bad event, it doesn't mean that this is the objective uh, truth. It's just one version of it, and we can change it. And actually, the most accurate memories are those we never retrieved. And really, the memories we don't want to think about too much are the good memories, because then we're going to change them. So we really, as people, are a work in progress. We keep revising wh who we are and what our past means. And we can just uh, remember that 
what it tells us in our everyday life is that memories are actually not accurate. They weren't even designed to be accurate. The purpose of memories is to tell us something about ourselves relative to the past and help, help us make pre better predictions for the future. So we have to think very carefully on how much we rely on memory and what does it mean, an accurate memory. But on the good side, we can change our bad memories. We can apply this technique in our everyday lives and also in therapy uh, and try to more accurately modify our therapeutic interventions such we, that we will target this particular window. Our memories are more dynamic than we thought. So what we should remember is that really there's no great difference between the memory of a dream and the memory of reality. Thank you. So let me see if I've, if I've got this right. There's no fixed memory. We have no stable um, memory. But every single time we remember something, we are recalling it and rewriting it. Well, there's good news and bad news there, right? Right. So the good news is that nothing has ever happened to me so bad that I can't tell it to myself again, but it means that my identity is more unstable than perhaps I thought, yeah? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can reinvent yourself every day. Did I also understand you to say that my memories become more attenuated the more times I retell myself? Yes. It's actually See, this, this, is, this is weird, right? <laughs> yeah, you can take a uh, married couples for 30 yeah. years. Yeah. If they want you know, sit uh, on the table and talk and compare memories, yeah. it's going to be completely different. It's as if they live different memories, and sometimes we switch memories amongst oursel ourselves. You, yeah. know, you grab your wi wife's memory or something of that sort. Well, that happens, in fact, all the yeah. time. Um, <laughs> one of the interesting implications of this is that the now much derided talking cure for psychotherapy where therapists invite you to retell a story right. and then shift the way you think about it actually might have some efficacy. Is that, is that fair? Yes. Yeah, so actually we know for quite a long time uh, that memories change. There's mm -hmm. um, 30 years of studies by Elizabeth Loftus that tells us that actually every day we invent a false memory. Huh. Um, but what's happening now is, this, is that neuroscience is catching up. And now we know the biological basis. So this is a wonderful opportunity for ethics and psychiatry and neuroscience to communicate and work together on how we uh, work with our memories. I noticed that Daniela threw up a picture of a witness stand. Are there legal implications for this? Is there any... How much validity do we place in the, in the hands of witnesses to a crime? Way too much. <laughs> um, you can influence eyewitness testimony um, just by investigating. The, the particular questions you ask, you can implant information. Um, and especially for emotional events, we just begin to understand how emotional memories work. Mm. And we don't really know how memory is supposed to be <laughs> when it's so intense. We have an assumption. But, uh, and we have expectations from, from eyewitnesses, but mm -hmm. we just begin to understand how memories are being distorted and actually mm -hmm. formed under great emotional stress. You have a personal connection with this. Your uh, father had some traumatic memories of his past. H how did that influence you? Well, I actually, I don't know his, uh, I, I never knew his memories. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he never talks about them. Yeah. Um, so I just went on and investigated other people's uh, <laughs> memories. Um, what I find fascinating about this, and then I'll let you go, is, is neuroscience is catching up with our individual empirical experiences of our own memory, the way that artists like Proust wrote about it, and the way that the more artistic margins of psychotherapy, like Freud, mm -hmm. uh, talked about memory. All that was right, and this very mechanistic computer model of yeah. memory turned out to be quite, quite wrong. Yeah. Um, actually, the only way to keep memories um, um, pure, <laughs> not, yeah. Yeah, pure, not modified, is, is through art. Yeah. Exactly like uh, they told it. Because if you carve a memory into a story or in, into an art yeah. form, this captures the original emotion that was in it. Yeah. And it's unchanged. It's actually recreating the emotion. So art has a very intimate relationship with memories. It's very strange stuff. Daniela Schiller, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.